Well, that's a lot of degradation in 20 minutes. And I think it's um, really typical and the thing that sort of motivates a lot of our work uh, in the center is trying to come to grips with that and how to translate that into um, some kind of solution-based approaches. There's been a number of active solutions that have um, now been considered, propagating coral fragments, seed banks, active translocation, selective breeding of hardy corals. But these are expensive, and they're not really have come yet with very much success. So there must be other solutions or factors that we can think about that might ameliorate or slow the decline of reefs. And what I want to do with my talk today is uh, take you through the what's happening in the subtropical area as a case study, not only of the bleaching, but of thinking about um, the factors that might, we might give more um, thought to when we're considering management approaches. Um, for a number of years, my group has been focusing on the ecological dynamics of subtropical coral communities along the eastern Australian coastline uh, through a number of different approaches, historical ecology, where we take uh, sediment cores and look at assemblages over time, uh, looking at latitudinal gradients in coral species assembly, and also what are some of the uh, environmental controls that are driving those gradients along these biogeographic transition zones. Now, much of our work has been placed in the context for the potential for subtropical eastern Australia to provide a refugium for northern corals as global warming results in the migration of corals to the south. Um, more hypothetical has been what's going to happen if coral populations in the north suffer severe mortality. Well, that ain't hypothetical any longer. Um, as Terry's just, uh, sorry for not acknowledging the source here, but, um, has just shown us the back-to-back -back, uh, bleaching events on the GBR, they, they raise some important issues for this refugium hypothesis. Do the thermal stress events that severely degrade tropical reefs have similar effects in tropical regions? Or are they worse, or are they less? How are the dominant taxa affected in the tropics? Are they the same as those in the north, or are they affected to the same degree? Is there any selectivity in the, in the corals and other organisms that are um, maintained over these latitudinal gradients? So in my talk, Today, I'm just going to provide some uh, a foundation, I guess, for tackling some of these questions. Um, I'm not, or we're not, at presently at a stage where we can provide definitive comparisons between tropical and subtropical assemblages, but I hope by examining the subtropical bleaching event in 2016 and the response of corals, um, we might get a, a foundation for future work that might lend insight into the capacity and the connectivity and the relationships between the reefs, tropical reefs in the north and those further south. Okay, so let's go on to the uh, 2016 thermal stress event, um, very well known, uh, very well predicted um, by NOAA, and um, he, with this heat map uh, showing the December to March 2016 uh, likely bleaching areas. And uh, uh, sure enough, uh, we bring this um, information down to the tropic, uh, subtropics. And in both of these graphs, the one on the left is the SST, uh, daily SST from January to June, um, shown against the mean monthly maximum, which are the horizontal bars. And also on the right, which is the um, uh, temperature anomaly from the long-term monthly site means. And you can see that in the subtropics, uh, we had a major um, thermal excursion during the same time uh, that was occurring uh, throughout the uh, world. And in fact, first reports of bleaching came in at the end of March, and we undertook a series of surveys in April of 2016 and redid our surveys in October 2016, um, to, uh, in, in April to look at the bleaching, and in October to document the mortality. So the data that I'm going to show you today is based on three data sets, 
Uh, one is in-situ surveys along um, transects of uh, 16 reefs over, um, over the subtropical um, region, which I'll show you a map of shortly. Uh, we also did photo, photo quadrats along these transects, brought the photos home, and then did more, um, uh, more detailed analysis of the photos for, for the bleaching. And then we also established a series of, uh, of uh, plots that we mapped where we tagged the colonies in April that were bleached to follow individual colonies and how they uh, responded in October. So the first uh, thing I'll, I'll show you is the latitudinal trends in site susceptibility. Um, site susceptibility is, is basically is just based on the bleaching index. Uh, for each genus, uh, but you weight it by the relative abundance of that genus at each site, and then you sum uh, across all genera present at a site. And if you look at the, um, um, this is the susceptibility index, the highest in red, it's a heat map. And if you look along this coastline, um, our, our sites go from Flinders Reef off the coast of Brisbane in the north, all the way down to Black Rocks in, in New South Wales. And a lot of our sites are in the solitary islands. But there is a, um, a rather pronounced north to south gradient in the um, site susceptibility and the intensity of bleaching along the subtropical coastline. Now, if you look at this graphically, you look at site susceptibility of latitude, um, there is a, 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 a pretty good relationship as you increase the latitude, the site susceptibility um, to bleaching increases, that is the bleaching intensity, but note at the high, high latitude uh, sites there is a tremendous amount of variability. Um, and what's driving that? Um, obviously um, there, there's a certain component of the degree of heating weeks, that is the thermal stress. Um, that line is significant but not very strong relationship. And I think, again, it's driven by um, the high variability shown in the southern sites with a um, uh, varied response to an increased in degree heating weeks. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple of minutes. So let's uh, go from latitude now to taxonomy. What was the selectivity in the, in the bleaching? And here's another map, uh, again, from our sites in the north all the way to the south. And this map is, uh, shows bleaching index along this axis here. Uh, bleaching index is uh, basically a measurement of bleaching impact uh, using the assessment categories of how much of the colony is bleached. It's measured for each genus and uh, for each site you just sum the um, bleaching index for individual genera. You notice two things. One is that there's uh, again this apparent trend in increasing bleaching from north to south. Um, however, the, uh, where there is bleaching in the north, there's a higher diversity of taxa, of coral taxa, that are suffering the bleaching, whereas in the south, the bleaching is mainly confined to Stylophora, Turbinaria, and in particular, Pocillophora and Parites. And I'll show you uh, graphs, more graphs that bring, bring this relationship out uh, a bit clearer. Um, and for the permanent tagging of the coral plots, I just wanted to show you these beautiful sort of underwater maps that we made um, from mooring sites. And we tagged different colonies uh, along these, um, within these maps. 31 map plots, 156 colonies at four sites in the solitary islands between about five and 12 meters water depth. We wanted to quantify bleaching, algal cover, and mortality. And uh, I don't have any mortality data to show you today from these plots, but the bleaching from these tagged colonies very much mimicked the taxonomic bias in the, in the bleaching that we found along the surveys. So the highest amount of bleaching occurring in Postolophora and Parietes, and then followed by Stylophora and Turbinaria, with many genera uh, not suffering uh, any bleaching at all, most notably Acropora. Um, we're still in the, in the, in the early stages of, of uh, playing with this data, but uh, I just thought we'd, we'd uh, look at the degree heating weeks and the relationship between degree heating weeks and bleaching index, because uh, intuitively one would think that this should be a nice straight line, the higher uh, degree heating weeks, the higher the bleaching impact. 
And for Postolopper and Parides, there is a, a certain uh, degree of that relationship, um, but, but really a rather weak trend. But for other, for other taxa, there, there isn't any real, in, any, any real trend in the bleaching index and the degree heating weeks. So, um, and we also find that some sites are consistently uh, high, have higher bleaching than others because these, these uh, circles again are color coded to the sites. So there's other things going on other than just um, degree heating weeks and, and thermal stress. And uh, so we're starting to think about, and we've got, we're starting to get data on the symbionts associated with the, um, with the corals and also looking at other environmental factors like, uh, like light. Uh, going to shelf location, here's two plots. One is the uh, percent of colonies bleaching versus shelf location. Uh, offshore uh, colonies were, uh, there's more bleach colonies in offshore sites, but the, uh, they're not as severely bleached as the mid-shelf sites because if you look at the bleaching index, the, uh, the intensity of bleaching is much greater in the mid-shelf regions than in the um, offshore regions. So a bias in the intensity of bleaching according to shelf. So we've got latitudinal bias, we've got taxonomic bias, and we've got shelf location bias in the response of these corals to this bleaching event. This shows, I think, rather nicely the, um, the intensity of the mid-shelf bleaching with parietes and postulopera having the highest uh, bleaching index. Again, it's a heat map. But look at the scale difference among the rose diagrams, 0, 5, 10, 0 to 40, 0 to 20 in the offshore. The highest uh, intensity of bleaching is in the mid-shelves. And you can see that the, the taxa that are most affected are really highly most affected. Most of the other taxa were not really uh, affected so much by the, uh, by the bleaching. Uh, just a little bit on mortality trends, um, just to show you, uh, we were curious about when we go out, go to these photo uh, transects, they were each randomly taken in, um, in, in the same sites, but obviously not exactly the same place. But we thought it'd be interesting to plot the percent bleaching at these uh, sites that we found in April and plot that against the percent mortality that we found in October. And really, we don't find bleaching as an explanatory variable for mortality among these two, uh, between these two time periods. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, the taxa that were the most highly bleached, like Postolopera and Parietes, um, suffered, although they suffered some, some mortality, it was relatively low. Um, Turbinaria, Stylophora um, was another one that, that bleached, not much mortality. Turbinaria, some mortality. So, um, and then some, some genera that, that um, bleached show, did show high mortality, so some of the other genera like Cephastria and Micromusa showed some, um, some bleaching and some mortality. But some genera that didn't bleach uh, very much at all, like a cropper, showed high mortality. Um, and one of the reasons for this is because there was um, a lot of storm damage that occurred between um, October, sorry, April and October. And so some of our mortality data is confounded by the, um, the, the damage that was in, in, incurred from, from the storms prior to the October surveys. Um, but um, I think it sort of remains as a conservative, um, you know, if this is the most that bleaching, mortality that bleaching gave us, if you even combine it with the storm damage, it really wasn't a lot. As a matter of fact, Andrew Baird has, uh, shared with us his surveys between 2013 and 2017, showing the difference between before the bleaching event, the mean percent uh, coral cover versus after. And in many cases, there's either no difference or the differences are, are, are not much. And if you look at the grand total, um, there's actually a higher percent coral cover in 2017 than there was in 2013. So I think the, the take home message from that is that there's really no overall reduction in percent live coral um, ac across that, that bleaching event. Um, we're also interested in community structures. Another, uh, another thing, you know, was the bleaching event enough to induce some change in the, in the coral communities? And Bridget Summer has um, 
has, has looked at the coral community structure up and down this coast. And there's lots of variability, but when you, when you look at some of her surveys in uh, 2010, and we've got surveys um, many years after that as well, but if you compare that to the April 2016 community structure and the October 2016 community structure on this uh, multi-dimensional um, um, multi scaling plot, there's no real, they just plot on top of one another. So the, um, any differences between April and, and October are minimal and really no different than the differences between 2010 and April 2016. So, so really not much an effect on community structure as well. So to summarize that, bleaching intensity was stronger in the south at higher latitudes. The worst bleaching was focused on relatively few taxa. The long-term effects were negligible in terms of percent cover and community structure. And mid-shelf localities were the hardest hit, but they appear to have recovered. So just briefly, um, looking at the GBR bleaching, um, there's some, some fundamental differences, I think, between what happened in the north and what happened in the south. I've taken uh, Terry's graph here and um, sort of color-coded this third line here about the, the number of, of reefs that were severely bleached. You see in the subtropics, our six reefs in southeast Queens and in northern New South Wales, there were zero of those that were severely bleached. And in the solitary islands further south, our 16 reefs, we only had 13% of those that were uh, severely bleached. So a very different sort of uh, story down, down south, I think. Um, Terry spoke and showed this graph about the winners and the losers, how the severity of bleaching, as it increases, it obscures. Uh, all the taxa uh, uh, begin to, to start losing quite dramatically. Uh, now, remember that our, the severity of our bleaching event, the degree heating weeks were only up to um, four to five. So the severity of our, of our event was, was only the first three colors of the Great Barrier Reef event. But even in those, we still don't see that kind of um, um, equity of response. As a matter of fact, the species were quite variable in, in their response. Some genera were quite um, affected and, and others weren't. So, um, there were winners and there were losers in, in the subtropics. Um, and this is the graph uh, that Terry showed in the previous talk showing the, the strong relationship between degree heating weeks and percent of the colonies bleached. Um, when you do that to our graph, uh, we have, again, we have a lot of variability suggesting that there's other factors besides just thermal stress that are involved in, in how the corals are uh, bleaching. But you also note the very different um, uh, scale here. So our degree heating weeks only go up to just over four. So we're only in this part of Terry's graph here. And look at that huge variability between two and four. And I think that's just what we're seeing uh, here in the subtropics. Okay, so um, what does this all mean? Um, the conclusions, thermal stress was relatively weak, but bleaching was fairly extensive um, up and down the coast from from north of Brisbane down to um, uh, um, solitary islands and south. The response to thermal stress was not uniform at the genus, latitude, and shelf position um, fa as factors. Mortality was limited and community structure was relatively unchanged, so recovery appears to have occurred. Um, now, this is the fun part. This is my last slide, but I'm going to sort of go on a little bit because um, what, is, what is this telling us about the, uh, the refugium potential of, the, um, of these reefs further south, of these subtropical reefs? I think in the first instance, um, this particular event has not severely compromised uh, the idea of these subtropical reefs of having some potential uh, to act as refugium. Um, but remember, we're looking at relatively low stress levels. Uh, is that a shifting baseline? Did we used to think that four and five was, was really high stress? Well, uh, maybe it is, but um, in, in comparison to what happened further north, we're looking at relatively low stress levels. And I like to bring in this idea um, that's being developed. It's not a, it's not a new idea, but it's being, um, so I think it's being progressed a little bit faster these days of, of what's called an ad adaptive portfolio approach. And that is where we look at priorities for conservation 
um, for locations with environmental heterogeneity that promote local adaptation. So in the subtropics, we've got diverse coral assemblages, diverse habitats, diverse responses to, to thermal stress and other stressors. There's connectivity involved in these, um, in these, in these reefs and these, in these heterogeneous habitats. And um, there's also a metapopulation structure that is maintaining their, um, their species diversity. And I think um, this provides uh, fertile ground for the subtropics and all their variability to be considered not as individual reefs and individual habitats, but as a mosaic of interacting um, ecosystems that each have adaptive potential and may have characteristics in common that promote uh, the adaptation of those populations to various environmental changes. Um, so the, the, the idea from, for conservation is, that, is to develop uh, these adaptive networks, these connections and these protections in place that preserve the, heter the heterogeneity in environments and habitats and species and so on. Um, so you have a, a greater diversity of options. I mean, in Webster's paper, they, they use the term, let nature decide the winners, but make sure we have these, these um, protections in place that are going to preserve uh, these networks connecting these highly variable systems. So instead of going out there and saying, well, there's the most highly diverse reef, let's conserve that one, or there's the most degraded one, let's put our resources into that one. No, it's more of a, an economic portfolio approach where you would never put your, all your money into a single stock or a single, even a single set of um, you know, mid-cap stocks or whatever. You, you spread your risk across um, various, uh, across your portfolio. And I think this is one of, I think the subtropics and the environmental heterogeneity really brings out that this approach could be something that would be uh, potentially more favorable than wasting a lot of dollars on these more active um, um, approaches that perhaps aren't going to yield too much success. Thank you very much.